In the middle of a virus, you'd certainly want to think about, do you really need to have someone who's like within 80 days of release serving those last 80 days? It's pure madness. Welcome to New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins, recording from my home in Brooklyn, New York City. In pretty much every area of life right now, I think a question at the front of everyone's mind is, what are things going to look like when the virus ends? We're starting a series with this episode on COVID-19 and the justice system. And I thought we ought to kick it off by asking just how much has the justice system changed in response to the pandemic? And then what are the chances some of those changes could become permanent? To get that reality check, I thought immediately of Rachel Barco. Rachel is a law professor at New York University. She was on the show last year to talk about her book, Prisoners of Politics. It focuses on how criminal justice policy actually gets made. Rachel is a rigorous thinker. Uh, She's someone with a huge appetite for data. She knows the value of a randomized controlled trial. But why I value her voice so much is that all of her work is propelled by a strong ethical core, uh, a commitment to making things better. And also, as you'll hear in what follows, a commitment to calling out injustices. So here's my conversation about justice and the virus with Rachel Barco. So, you know, I wanted to talk to you today because we've been hearing a lot about how under COVID-19, the justice system is maybe showing more compassion and maybe turning more to decarceration. And yes, it's doing that only because it's being forced to but hey, maybe we can make use of this moment to make a kind of uh, quote unquote new normal after this pandemic ends. And I, I'm wondering what you think of that kind of more optimistic take. You know, it's probably overly optimistic, I would say. For one, we're not really seeing a very big change when it comes to prisons and prison population reductions. It's really business as usual for the most part, which is pretty depressing in a pandemic. So to the extent we're seeing changes, it's really mostly with jails and pretrial detention. So I will say that part is good, that really close assessment about thinking, who should you really detain pretrial? But, you know, it's been pretty modest, I have to say. And I think, you know, for every place that you might look at a a San Francisco, say, that's really been robust in its efforts. You have so many jurisdictions around the country who've done basically nothing in that regard. So I'm still going to maintain my role as your resident wet blanket and say that this isn't as much as I would have liked to have seen. So rather than what some people are seeing as a justice system that's able to respond very quickly and make some real changes, you're, you're more seeing a system, if anything, that is clinging ever tighter to the same reflexes and and patterns that got us into mass incarceration to begin with? I think so. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of like when people say, you know, you have a giant ship in the ocean and getting it to, you know, it doesn't turn on a dime. This big bureaucracy is like that. It, it just doesn't turn. And, and I think it's also a cultural problem. If you look at departments of corrections, the Bureau of Prisons, prosecutors' offices, and you look at the filings that they're making and the responses that they have to this crisis, you would just never know there was a pandemic taking place. It's it's the same kind of rote response they have in, in every case. No, you can't release this person because it would be a danger to public safety. There is a presumption they should be detained. And, you know, there's kind of no, well, wait a minute, <laughs> should we step back and ask, is it really in the interest of public safety to add to prison populations and jail populations in light of what we know about the spread of this virus? I mean, overall health and safety, we're better off with fewer people. But that kind of weighing of the calculus is just not something I'm seeing by prosecutors' offices and corrections officials around the country. I mean, that is a really rare view. But to push back on you a little bit, you're, you've made this distinction between prisons and jails, and, and I want to explore that a bit. But if we start with the more good news story, which is jails, right, which is where people are held on lower offenses and for generally for a year or less and, and are places where most people are held awaiting trial. There, as you've said, you know, in, in some big cities, for example, like New York City and San Francisco, we have seen a real shift. Certainly, in New York City was criticized for moving too slowly. But movement has started now. The population of jails in New York City is down by 30 percent. 
both arrests and arraignments in the city have been slashed. Is there not reason there to think if we can show that this does work, if the data shows at the end this didn't pose some huge peril to public safety, that that really could lead to a good outcome at the end of all this? I mean, that would be great if it happened. You know, I'll give you some reasons why I'm a little doubtful. The first is that we were seeing a decline in those populations even before the pandemic. And a big part of that was because of the bail reform changes that had passed. You all produced the Center for Court Innovation, produced a great report on this that, you know, explains that we got an enormous reduction from the bail reform legislation of about 40 percent. Yeah, about 40 percent of New York City's pretrial jail population dropped in the year since the initial reform was was passed. Right. So, so I mean, a big reason for the decline is that. So your question was, might we sort of see from this reduction, people will see it's okay and then kind of maintain it. But if we look at the story of bail, we had that similar population drop. And in the middle of a pandemic, we couldn't even get people to wait. And let's see how it goes with reducing that population. You had instead a couple media reports, sensationalized accounts of, you know, cases that they tried to claim posed a threat under the new bail law. And in the middle of a pandemic, the governor forced through changes to that bail reform, which is going to increase the jail population. <laughs> you know, Again, using your report's numbers, it's going to increase it by 16%. So I'm skeptical that we're in an environment where people kind of calmly, rationally say, oh, hey, you know, we kind of have this natural experiment. <laughs> let's, let's take a look. And instead, what I fear might happen instead is if someone can pinpoint one person who was released because of kind of a, an effort to reduce the population from COVID and that person commits another crime, is there going to be some New York Post story or daily news story about that person that's going to have people say, see, you know, this is why you can't release so many people. Those stories have already started, really. Yeah. And I worry about that dynamic kind of swallowing up the good data, but it may be that will have some effect, but the overall net good may still outweigh it, right? It may still be that, you know, people certainly, I think the, you know, general public and, and maybe even some law enforcement folks who don't pay much attention to what goes on in jails and prisons might be more attuned now to just how horrible the conditions are. And, and you maybe they'll think twice before they seek detention, right? Or they'll, you know, this crisis is going to be with us for a while. And so maybe this has a better chance of kind of getting data behind it than the bail reform did, where, you know, it was barely three months off the ground before it had been stifled. And I do think if we did do that, I think if we actually gathered data, that we would find that you actually can safely release these people, and it's not going to lead to poorer public safety outcomes. And then when you know you add, in addition to that, the public health benefits, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer to do this. But even in the absence of a virus, we detain too many people, and it ends up having counterproductive effects because you know you detain people and they lose their jobs and they lose custody of their kids and they get evicted because they can't pay rent and they have no place to go. It's kind of a life-altering thing. So we already have studies that show just detaining people pre-trial itself makes them more likely to commit more crimes. So it's a bad practice on kind of any measure and reducing it is is good for public safety. It's good for saving money. You know, it's good for just respecting human liberty. It's kind of good on every measure. What it's not good for is the kind of politics of tabloid journalism, because whoever supports that kind of idea is going to have to explain all those things. And, you know, it's not soundbite material. You have to take a little time to walk people through it, um, as opposed to just you run one story that gets everybody's attention and they say, ah, see, this is why you can't let them out. And I mean, you're someone who studies criminal justice reform, how it happens, and really why so little of it happens. And I guess you could say that jails are easier places right now to implement reforms, right? Because you have people in there with mostly lower level offenses and the like. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that population, as you say, is, um, you know, misdemeanors um, and a bunch of people who haven't been convicted of anything. And for the ones who have, it's it's lower level kinds of things that are the areas where we've seen more reform efforts taking off because, you know, those are the things that is more that are more palatable to the public. It gets harder when you have more serious charges against people to argue for release. There's a 
whole cognitive psychological field on this, <laughs> uh, the endowment effect that people have. It's this weird sense that, you know, you give a sentence to somebody, it's 10 years, and there's a kind of sensibility among the public that, well, that's what we get. We get 10 years from this person, you know, not a day less. And so if you release the person before 10 years and they go on to commit another crime, the, you know, kind of the immediate reaction is, you know, we lost this thing that we otherwise had. And what you don't get is someone saying, you know, they're going to get out in 10 years anyway, <laughs> you know, and, and does the extra time actually have negative effects? Could we, could we try to measure what happens when we keep people in too long? So kind of a rational way to look at it would be what is the right sentence length given all of the trade-offs that we're thinking about? But we really don't have that kind of discourse. None of it is a question of, hey, how was that sentence set in the first place? Which, by the way, almost every sentence is completely arbitrary and based in nothing. You know, there's, there's no science behind any of it. These are random numbers thrown out for people in the middle of a virus. You'd certainly want to think about, do you really need to have someone who's like within 80 days of release serving those last 80 days in the middle of a pandemic? And, and by the way, that's the kind of thing we're talking about right now. It's, it's pure madness because we have people who are going to be out in a month, in two months, in three months. And Surely any sensible jurisdiction would say, get them out now, you know, before they are infected. But instead, it's, well, no, it's only people who it's nonviolent offenses, who are pregnant, who are over 50. But you really need to ask yourself why you'd have those arbitrary lines when these, these folks are getting out anyway in a matter of two months, three months. Keeping them in is, is madness, but that's because of this whole psychological, I think, political effect that the public has where if they were to get out earlier, even if it's 80 days earlier and commit a crime, there'd be this blame game attached to having made that decision. Right. I, th there's so much churn in jails that you can reduce the population pretty effectively simply by slowing down ad admissions, new admissions, which we've been seeing. Whereas in prisons, you really need to have the system actually revisit its decisions, uh, which I think you've shown the system is very reluctant to do. And that's clearly playing a huge, a, a huge role in keeping down prison reduction. So just how bad is the situation when we're looking at what's happened to the population in prisons, you know, over since since COVID-19 hit? When we're thinking about prison populations, it is a really modest decline um, in overall numbers. Um, you know, barely a registered blip if you were to chart it out on a graph um, in terms of the numbers dropping. You know, so like less than 1% uh, of overall prison population declines. And some places, you know, are just flat. There's been no reduction at all. An anemic response, especially given what we're looking at. So do you feel like the reform community is just not paying enough attention to this disparity between what's happening in jails and prisons and getting a little bit carried away on the jail side, so to speak? It's a big tent, the criminal justice reform community. So, you know, certainly the people I talk to are depressed and miserable because they are laser focused on the fact that there is a real crisis in our prisons and no one's doing anything about it. So I think there are plenty of people that are taking note of how awful the response has been there and are really worried about it. Um, so I guess it, you know, it may just depend who we're talking to and kind of what people choose to emphasize. And I think, you know, at a time like this, you certainly are grateful for any efforts in jails to reform things. And, you know, that's all to the good. But if you're not thinking about prisons as well, you're missing the bigger part of the incarceration pie. So we know that infection rates, I mean, jails and prisons are uh, emerging as epicenters of this virus uh, across the United States. It's I'm just it's amazing to think that not more is being done. And you've talked about sort of bureaucratic kind of uh, inertia as, as one of the reasons for that. But it also seems to be just making clear in this terribly stark way that the kind of denial of uh, humanity, that the attitude that we take to, to people who are behind bars. You are hearing stories all around the country of people who are infected alone in their cells, crying and begging for help, and no one is coming to them. No one's coming to offer them medical assistance. They're just kind of being left to rot there. The one thing I am, I guess, more of an optimist on is that I think when people are aware 
and are close to issues, they feel an emotional connection to them. And the only reason that this has been able to go on the way it has is just because it is so far removed. But the more people know, I think the more they would speak out and demand that we do something. I I do think people will feel a connection to the human beings who are inside these facilities. And, And I will say staff and incarcerated people alike, because it's not like the virus is distinguishing inside facilities between people who work there and people who are sentenced there. You know, it's spreading among staff as well, and they're bringing it home to their families and their communities. And then I also think, you know, unfortunately, there is a segment of the population that I think Michelle Alexander in a recent column really eloquently captured that I think there are some people out there who put people who are incarcerated in some box as how deserving of less, you know, deserving of less health care or, you know, deserving of less consideration. It is a little bit of that do the crime, do the time. I believe, though, that even among those people, if they got close and actually talked to the people inside prisons who had committed crimes and heard their stories and met them, I think a large number of them would change their minds. I, I really do. And I think we see that when we see the people who are part of the criminal justice reform movement. It is not a coincidence that so many of them are personally affected. Either they themselves were incarcerated or a loved one was or someone else that they knew. And it's what mobilizes them for, for change. Because I do think as people get closer to this one, they care more. So uh, on that question of building public awareness of the harms of the criminal justice system, how do you think the media has been doing in general of late? And I, I mean specifically how they are covering, say, the reductions that have happened and, and the reforms that uh, have happened as a result of COVID-19. Yeah, well, you know, there's some specialized outlets that, you know, deserve a special shout out for excellent coverage like The Appeal and The Marshall Project, which I think, you know, do a tremendously good job covering these issues and really a mix of narratives of people inside as well as broader policy pieces on what's happening and what's good and what's bad. And, and you know, there's some reporters around the country for certain publications that, that are doing a good job, but they are the exception because, by and large, what you see when you read, including, you know, papers like the New York Times is, you know, you get a lot of stories that are law enforcement quotes are heavy in them about, well, we can't release more people. It'd be public safety disaster. So, you know, we're doing what we can while maintaining the public safety we need. And there's not really any questioning of that. You know, there's not really a question of, wait, is that helping public safety? You know, is it really, is it really a trade-off between helping people not get the virus versus, you know, there's going to be a crime spree? Or in fact, are the two goals consistent with each other? And you could both reduce crime and viral spread by reducing the population. And then, you know, the worst form of journalism in all this is the Willie Horton style that we have never gotten away from that, you know, is still as strong today as it ever was, where all it takes is one case. And it it's everywhere. So, you know, in this pandemic, the, the case that's gotten the most attention was a man down in Florida who was released pre-trial, uh, I think from a drug charge, and then um, allegedly committed a homicide afterwards. And the way the story ran was that his release was tied to concerns with populations because of COVID. And, and I don't even know if that's true because I've seen disputes about whether or not he would have been released anyway. But it was reported as, here's someone released because of COVID concerns and he went and he killed somebody. I have seen it in court papers. I, I've seen it filed in court papers in federal court in South Dakota where the prosecutor said, well, we don't want a situation like that. <laughs> you know, I've seen it. Other people have told me that prosecutors have mentioned the case case in, in proceedings that they've been involved in. Um, the, there's a U.S. attorney in Pennsylvania who mentioned that case for arguing that we really shouldn't see more releases. So, you know, this one case, which you couldn't have worse social science, right? We know nothing about why he was selected and, or about the overall population of people released. Because if we're thinking that there have been several thousand people released as a result of these efforts, and if that is the only case or one of a handful, then we are looking at a rate of, you know, 99% success in terms of no recidivism incidents or problems. But just like Willie Horton's furlough program was 99.9% successful, nobody cared, right? They only cared about him. And that is still the media MO, even in a time of pandemic. Yeah, on, on the subject of people sticking to their narratives, 
law enforcement in the main has been sticking to its focus on public safety and the and the uh, some would say narrow way in which law enforcement defines public safety. But ha- have you been surprised that they haven't been more supportive and lobbying more for reductions in jails and prisons? I mean, given just what you've already mentioned, the number of corrections officers that we see getting infected. Yeah, it's kind of a fascinating. I mean, in the New York Department of Corrections, you have over 1,200 people who work for the Department of Corrections who have tested positive and four people have died. So I am really surprised that they haven't done more to advocate for the release of people so that you could have better distancing inside these facilities. It's kind of similar to the fact they don't really speak out on prison conditions either, even though the conditions in these facilities are abysmal. And, you know, I think it's just a real kind of mental struggle that people have, you know, in part, they think to themselves, you know, well, why should people who commit crimes get this good thing, even when it's cutting off your nose to spite your face, because you would both increase your own work conditions and make them better. And it'd be good for public safety, because it would make it more likely that people don't reoffend when they get out. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons to do it. And yet, there's that resistance there that I do think stems from this I don't want them to have it, even if it means I'll also suffer. And I think that's part of what we're seeing in terms of their lobbying now, where they're not really calling for more releases, because I think it's that kind of sensibility that, well, it's them versus us, as opposed to we are literally all connected here. You're connected to people who are a different race than you, of a different social class than you, people in different countries from you. Like, you just can't build a wall around yourself and just fend for yourself. We're all in it together. And I do not think the we are all in it together mindset is really prevalent among law enforcement and corrections officers. Another factor in trying to understand what a post-COVID criminal justice landscape could look like is the economic crisis that this country is heading into right now. And we know when there's an economic crisis, crime can go up. We also know that criminal justice reforms at the best of times are very vulnerable to crime rates going up. So what would be your concern there about a kind of post-COVID criminal justice future? Yeah, I, I am really worried about that. One legitimate concern that some governments have had with releasing people is to where, you know, if we release them, where will this person go? You know, it just breaks open the fact that we have a severe housing shortage and we have a severe shortage in programming for people, you know, to help them with reentry, to help them when they're out with drug treatment and mental health treatment and the other services and wraparound services they need to succeed. And at a time of a fiscal crisis, those things which were already underfunded are going to be cut even more. And because, you know, we're looking at people with massive unemployment it's highly likely we're going to see crime go up in certain sectors. And I think the response to that is is highly likely to be more policing, you know, the kind of immediate, let's deal with it right now. We have this problem. Let's just kind of quickly deal with it without really thinking what we really need is investment. And, you know, this is an old story. We already know this, that, you know, there've been these investments in policing and incarceration and not in the kind of infrastructure, social services, you know, kind of urban renewal, the kinds of things that actually would do a better job addressing crime. But, you know, they take time and you don't see the fruits of those kinds of things until later. And if you're dealing with like an immediate crime issue or a concern with disorder right away, the demand is going to be to deal with it right away with policing. I mean, you know, I think James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, does such a good job describing this dynamic in Washington, D.C. There's just an increase in drug use and gun violence, and the community there wanted all these longer-term investments, but, you know, they also wanted the immediate addressing of these problems, and they got the kind of immediate policing and incarceration, and they never got the long-term investments because that's kind of how we politically respond to these things. And I really fear we're going to see that again. I I think you see signs of it when you look at the New York budget that no cuts to policing, you know, but but cuts to everything else. You know, to, to try to end on a more uh, hopeful note, is there anything that has surprised you, I mean, in a good way, about responses across the country or, or something you could point to, or, or maybe you just want to imagine something 
that you think would be a helpful launching point for, you know, the more systemic reforms that it's so clear from your writing, you know, you so fervently want? So there's a few. Um, I, you know, I am definitely heartened by San Francisco's really dramatic reduction in the jail population and Chase Boudin's efforts as the district attorney there to really support that and encourage more of it. That is a model that we should all be looking at. And if it succeeds, I think that would be such a great thing for other jurisdictions to emulate. I think it's been encouraging to see some governors use their clemency powers to try to address this because that's a big part of what they're for. I was pleased to see the Republican governor of Oklahoma do it. I think Governor Bashir in Kentucky is probably the best in terms of thinking about how to proactively use his authority to address the pandemic and the criminal justice system. So, you know, we do have at least a couple political leaders. And then, and I guess the the last one that I will say that I think is, is promising is when the First Step Act was passed at the federal level, Congress actually put something in there that allows people not to have to get the motion for compassionate release for things like terminal illnesses, crises like this one. Before, the only way it could ever be considered is the Bureau of Prisons had to file the motion. Um, And if they didn't file it, you never got your day in court. And Congress changed that so that, you know, if the Bureau of Prisons doesn't respond to you in 30 days, you do get to go to court directly to a judge. And there are some, you know, kind of promising things we're seeing there, because I think we're seeing some federal, not all, but we are seeing some federal judges around the country reading these motions for a compassionate release, really learning about federal prisons and what's going on there and granting them. And, you know, not just granting them and giving the relief to the person who's filing, but I think developing a deeper understanding of what's happening in prisons themselves, which I think will help when they're thinking about sentencing more generally, when they're thinking about the judiciary's kind of role in terms of oversight of prisons generally. So, you know, there are people who care and there are some people who are showing some leadership on this issue. I just wish there were many more of them. Well, Rachel, it's uh, as ever really bracing and uh, illuminating to talk to you. And um, I I really appreciate your perspective and I appreciate you making the time to join us again. Oh, thanks for having me. One of these days, you got to have me on for something that... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that, that's more uplifting and positive, but, you know, it's it's tough to find those things in criminal justice. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll have to put our heads together. All right. Sounds good. Thank you again, Rachel. Oh, you too. Take good care. That was my conversation with Rachel Barco. Rachel is a professor of law at New York University and the author of the 2019 book, Prisoners of Politics, Breaking the Cycle of Mass Incarceration. For more information about today's show and some suggestions for further reading, click the link to the episode page in your show notes or visit courtinnovation.org slash newthinking. Today's socially distanced episode was produced and edited by me. Samiha Mia is our director of design. Emma Dayton is our VP of outreach. Our theme music is by Michael Aaron at quivernyc.com. And our show's founder is Rob Wolf. This has been New Thinking from the Center for Court Innovation. I'm Matt Watkins. Thanks for listening, and stay safe.